just because we are expecting quite a lot of people, I'll also pop you all on mute for now, just to keep the background noise under control as well. So I'll just give it another minute for um, people arriving in the waiting room and then joining, and then we'll kick off. Thanks again to all of you for being um, prompt in joining tonight's webinar. Much appreciated. Right, so it's three minutes past. I'm going to get us started. There are still a few more joining from the waiting room as we get going. For those of you who've just joined, um, to let you know, uh, we are recording this evening's webinar so that those who could not attend tonight can view it uh, promptly uh, afterwards. So good evening and thank you for sparing uh, an hour of your time or so uh, to hear about the Soil Capital Carbon program, the longest running certified and multinational carbon payment program in Europe. And it's a, a timely moment to be having this conversation because, of course, our annual sign up deadline is the end of February, um, just around the corner. So hopefully we can share with you relevant information about how the program works and uh, inform you about whether this is something that you would want to look at further um, in the course of the next hour. My name is Andrew Voisey. I'm the Chief Impact Officer for Soil Capital. I'm going to be joined tonight uh, presenting by a colleague, Lyndon Cathers, who's one of our agronomists. And what we want to do is take you through the following agenda. We'll start by introducing you to Soil Capital and our view on carbon, because I think it's important to locate us as a firm and, and our beliefs and our view on, on carbon overall. I will then uh, share a few thoughts on how the carbon markets themselves work, because I don't assume that we all start with the same um, information uh, in evaluating this opportunity because this marketplace is so new to so many of us. Thirdly, uh, we'll look at the very important practicalities of getting paid and how it works and answering many of the frequently asked questions that, that come up. And finally, Lyndon will then uh, make this real with some numbers, some case studies of British farmers already in the programme. Now, you'll find, as with every Zoom, that there is a chat function that you can use. Please do log your questions as they come to your heads. Um, Lyndon will be working in parallel to either answer them directly or curate them. And at the end of each section, I'll pause and, and capture questions that have been raised during that section. So please feel free to type away while that question is fresh in your mind. Um, the more questions we have from you, the more we can ensure that we're actually answering what you need to learn this evening. So to kick off, let me introduce Soil Capital. Many of you, I think, know us already, but I won't assume that's true for everyone. And I always start with this picture because it's a photo of our headquarters in Belgium, as it happens. Uh, and what you can see there is a, a working grain store, two of them actually, uh, on, in the center on the, on the left, uh, on the right, a potato storage facility. And our headquarters is on the end of that left-hand grain store um, there. And the reason I use that picture is to illustrate the reality that soil capital has existed for now 10 years, and we were founded as an independent agronomy firm in 2013 by, on the left of your picture there, a farmer and agronomist, Nicholas, and on the right, uh, a business and financial professional, Chuck. So we're rooted in farming communities, in farming, in the business of farming. And what brought Chuck and Nicholas together originally was the shared view between them that farming in a way that improves soil health should be a way that Im improves farm profitability as well. So a real overlap between what you might think of as the environmental and the economic. 
And to begin with, our business model was, was very straightforward. We worked um, as an advisory firm to farmers or landowners seeking to transition their management systems. Um, we also took land under management directly ourselves. And this was happening um, not just in Belgium or even Europe, but actually on four or five continents around the world as the team exposed itself to multiple different contexts to really challenge this, this belief that soil health improvements and farm profitability improvements can go hand in hand. Four years ago, though, we pivoted uh, the focus of our business. Um, we still do that advisory and land management work through now a separate legal entity called Soil Capital Farming. And four years ago, we decided to focus Soil Capital's business on this central challenge we now focus on of unlocking carbon payments. And we did that because we are really driven by a mission to help as many farmers as possible adopt practices that do improve their soil health and their farm profitability. What we saw though, through our own direct boots on the ground experience was that what was needed to appeal to very many farmers at scale was bringing a new financial incentive, a new financial reward to the table for taking the risk of changing management practices. And the way we decided to start by doing that was to do what we can as an agronomy firm to unlock carbon payments for farmers. Now, before I go any further into talking about carbon payments, I want to make one central point really, really clear. And it's uh, illustrated very simply on this slide, which is that even before any of us start talking about getting paid for carbon improvements, we, Soil Capital, have a very profound belief that carbon in the soil is good for farmers. And I'm not going to labour that point tonight because I think this is in increasingly a, a widely held view. But what you're looking at, of course, on, on these images are some very visual reminders of why this is the case. You know, on the one hand, we could be talking about carbon in the soil as a source of natural fertility, which um, you know, at a time where fertilizer prices are doing what they're doing is a strategic consideration. Uh, on the other hand, on the right there, you're clearly looking at, at three different slake tests, testing the um, resilience of different types of soil to being inundated with water. So carbon, again, in the soil is a story about organic matter, structure to the soil, and therefore the soil's ability to either absorb water when there's too much of it or retain water when there's too little of it. And again, um, at a time where every year now, every season seems to be defined by either having too much or too little water, this is a strategic consideration. And I could go on, right? But the point here is just simply to say, soil capital has a long track record for boots on the ground agronomic work to improve soil health to get more carbon in the soil. We haven't sprung up into ex existence simply because someone decided to start talking about monetizing carbon, but we are now using that as a catalyst, as an accelerant to help many, many more farmers adopt the sorts of practices that will put more carbon in the soil. So that's all I wanted to say about who we are, Soil Capital, and, and our views on carbon. And I'll just pause, um, Lyndon, in case there are any immediate questions in the chat. I can't see any, but maybe you could just confirm for me. Nothing so far. All right. That sets the scene. But as I say, please do feel free to continue to uh, punch away any, any thoughts or questions that come to your mind. So I'll now move on to this section on carbon markets fundamentals. And, and as I said, we do this because we we know very clearly from the from the hundreds of conversations we have every week with with growers around the country that the carbon markets are new to us all and therefore we don't all have the same understandings or beliefs about how they work when we start considering carbon payment programs and that's quite an important basis of knowledge to to build so there are a few thoughts here about how those carbon markets work and i'm going to start with something which is known in the wider business world as the mitigation 
hierarchy. So this is basically making the point that increasingly companies that are taking action on climate change, either because they have regulatory or other commercial business motives for doing so, they have a sort of waterfall, a priority list of the actions they need to take. And this waterfall or this hierarchy is coming from initiatives like the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which some of you might have heard about, but effectively big companies, especially publicly listed companies out in the wider world, are now aligning with this initiative, which basically requires them to focus first on reducing their own emissions, you know, what's coming out of the factory chimney or what's associated with the electricity they use. And then, and this is super important for farmers to understand, and then look at the emissions associated with their supply chains or their value chains. And these are the first order priorities. And only once they've achieved deep emissions reductions from their own operations and from their supply chain, are they then permitted to look outside of those two areas and look for emissions reductions elsewhere through things like carbon offsetting. And to sort of bring this home to the food sector, um, this number varies, of course, depending on which subsector we're looking at, but it can be as much as 90 or 95 percent of a food company's emissions that sit in the supply chain, much of that being at farm level. And I think that helps to put into perspective the dependency that food companies are increasingly going to have on primary producers, on farmers, on you all, um, to reduce their supply chain or their value chain emissions. So this hierarchy is being established as we, as we speak. It's becoming more normal in everyday business practice. And it's important to understand what that means for farmers. And I'll unpack that um, as we go. Now, the next um, topic I want to address in terms of carbon market fundamentals is, if you like, a bit of a myth which, which comes up because I think a lot of the growers we speak to sometimes carry with them um, concerns as if a decision to enter a carbon payment program is as weighty as a decision to sell the family silverware. And I think that comes about because there is a belief that all soils have carbon in them already, which of course is true. And in a carbon payment scheme, access to that big stock of pre-existing carbon is being traded away. A bit like assigning mining rights to some other company. And that simply isn't how the carbon markets, the private sector carbon markets work. As you can see from this diagram, the yellow section of soil there is representing carbon that was already in your soil before you chose to join a carbon payment scheme. And that pre-existing carbon is simply not traded. It's not of interest to the markets. What is of interest is the carbon that you can add to the soil each year while you're in a scheme. And you can see that in the sort of black bit of the cross section where there are little C's for carbon being added and the pound signs to indicate that that is what is being um, recognized and valued by the market. So it's really important to distinguish between that pre-existing stock of carbon, which is not traded, and the additions that you make to that stock each year through practices that we'll come on to talk about, um, which uh, is exactly what is valued by the market. Now, the next point is that it really does matter how you sell your carbon. Um, and it matters in particular because, again, very many of the conversations we have with growers will at some point raise a concern that the grower doesn't want to enter a carbon trading scheme today out of a fear that they may need that carbon in the future if, say, the supply chain requires them to be net zero at some point in the future. And that is a legitimate concern if you're selling your carbon via what's called carbon offsetting. But that's not actually the full picture for how you can sell your carbon. 
But let me explain the difference now between carbon offsetting and carbon insetting. Carbon offsetting is what you're seeing demonstrated on the screen now. And it's what we're all more familiar with, I think, from you know, everything from shops, supermarkets to, to even you know, booking a flight and being offered the, uh, the opportunity to offset our emissions. So it basically works as follows. You know, here you've got a very simplistic representation of the food chain on the left. That's the yellow um, set of Eastern European dolls. Um, the farmer, the crop buyer, and the food brand. And on the right, you've got an unrelated organization. Let's call it an airline. The airline has done what it can to reduce its emissions, but it still has a need for further carbon improvements in order to be able to talk publicly to claim carbon neutrality. So what do they do? They engage in offsetting. They pay money to someone else, in this case a farmer, in exchange for the claim over that farmer's carbon improvements. And you can see the carbon transferring to the unrelated organization there. And the point with carbon offsetting is that once the claim to that carbon improvement has been bought by the airline, that claim can no longer be made by the farmer. Otherwise, two different parties would be making the same claim for the same carbon improvement, and you'd have a double counting situation. So this is the sort of setup that if you like, reinforces that fear that, well, what if I need that carbon in the future? But as I said, there is another way. And this is less well understood, but it's actually very important given what I said about the mitigation hierarchy um, earlier on. And that other way is carbon insetting. And that's effectively where the carbon improvements are paid for within the supply chain or the value chain. And so the carbon claim is made by the supply chain as well. Now, the crucial thing to understand about this setup is that before anybody starts paying anybody else for improving their carbon footprint, there is already a replication of the farmer's carbon footprint throughout the supply chain. It works like this. If a carbon accountant comes along to do the farmer's carbon footprint, fine, we look at the farmer's operations and inputs and so on, and we come up with a number. If a carbon accountant comes along to look at assessing the carbon footprint for a crop buyer, let's call this a maltster buying barley. Yes, they'll look at the uh, emissions from the chimney. They'll look at the electricity used and the other fuel used, but they will also look at the emissions associated with the maltster's supply chain, which will include the barley that is grown by the farmer. And so hence the barley grower's footprint will appear as a replication on the maltster's carbon accounts as well. This is before we even start, and the carbon accountants do this to emphasize the dependency between these entities from a carbon point of view. So when you understand that already the, car the farmer's carbon footprint is replicated across these different steps in the, in the supply chain, it also makes sense that when the farmer reduces that carbon footprint, the farmer can claim that reduction, and so too can the crop buyer, and so too can the food brand. And there is no problem with that. It's a completely legitimate reality, widely, widely accepted and acknowledged in the carbon accounting world. And so in the space of carbon insetting, this challenge of, well, what if I need that claim on carbon improvements in the future, goes away, because the farmer still retains the right to that claim. And you can see in, in small but important language at the bottom right there that at Soil Capital, we focus on carbon insetting for this reason and for frankly many other reasons as well. Quite often uh, a farmer will say to us, well, hang on a minute, so far so good, but don't I need to be net zero before I can be paid? And the simple answer to this question is that from a market point of view, the technical answer is no. The market pays for you to transition up to net zero and to get beyond it. Now, morally, you might have a different point of view um, and that's an individual personal choice, that, that's totally up to you. But as I say, from the market point of view, technically, you do not need to be net zero before you can be paid. And this is, this is why. Carbon markets have existed for many decades now. Originally, 
to find the most economically efficient, i.e. the cheapest way to reduce our emissions globally. Because it doesn't matter where a ton of CO2 is emitted, it has the same impact on the atmosphere wherever it is. And you can see here an illustration of that. It's a lady, presumably in Africa, um, cooking with what's called a, you know, a clean cook stove. Now that cook stove is still emitting greenhouse gases, but it's emitting far fewer greenhouse gases than it was compared to the technology she was using before. And she has received payments from the carbon markets to enable her to buy that clean cook stove. So in really simplistic terms, she's gone from being a sort of high emitter to let's say a low emitter, but she's not at net zero yet. If we just look at her, her cooking practices. And that's fine because the market is incentivizing and enabling her to transition towards net zero. Now, of course, what's also since happened with the carbon markets is that they've expanded to incentivize and reward carbon sequestration, different technologies or practices that pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and lock it up in different ways. The caricature example being locking it up in, in trees. But of course, what we now know is that uh, a farmer's soil is a significant store of carbon and the way it's managed can increase how much carbon is stored in that stock of, of the soil. And the final thing I want to say about carbon market fundamentals, and then we'll take, I can see uh, a few questions popping up. The final point I want to make clear, you know, we're gonna go on to talk about uh, this concept of a greenhouse gas balance on a farm. And we're um, most frequently talking about arable systems. And I want to just explain what the boundaries are when we're talking about a greenhouse gas balance. So the point here is that in any given harvest cycle, as I'm sure you will know, um, the different operations and management practices that, that we're implementing every day are sources of greenhouse gas emissions, but also drivers of increased soil carbon sequestration. And we need to balance those two off each other in order to come up with a net position or a balance. And so within the scope of the analysis that we do consistently on all farms um, over every year, um, we look at sources of emissions such as um, fertilizer applied and the product, the emissions associated with producing that fertilizer, fuel that is consumed, um, pesticides, again, the energy that is used to produce those and so on. So all of the red arrows you can see are sources of green ga greenhouse gas emissions. And the green arrows that you can see are the sources of soil carbon sequestration. And when you take a step back from this, the big drivers of a greenhouse gas balance on an arable farm are going to be your fertilization strategy, number one, your tillage or cultivation strategy, number two, and your cover cropping strategy, number three, which of course, all of these are affected by um, the local context, the rotation, the soil type, and so on. But just to pull out of this diagram, those are the three big drivers. So, Lyndon, I'll pause there. Let's just take um, the questions, if you could help me uh, catch up with what they are on, on this section. Sure. Um, first one, James, are you happy that that has been answered um, in the slides? We're happy to elaborate further if needed, but OK, we've got a nod. Um, the second one is why we draw the line at the field gate in our model, essentially, um, and why do we not take into account the emissions from drying or transport and the likes? Yeah, it's a good question because, of course, there are real emissions associated with those activities. Um, it's in order to keep um, a fair basis for comparing farms on a like for a like basis. Um, I was on farm today in Berkshire where the farmer has um, grain storage and grain drying facilities, but that's not true of all farms. So if we were to include the impact of the energy he uses uh, and compare that to another farm where the grain is dried off farm, it simply wouldn't be a fair comparison. So um, this is a product of the protocol that we have in place through our certification against uh, an ISO standard, which I'll come on to talk about soon, to ensure that we're comparing like with like.
Okay. Uh, next question was um, chop straw results in increased um, emissions, but also in sequestration. Where is that balance? Um, I guess I can answer that is it entirely depends on a range of factors, really soil types, um, what the straw is coming from, which crop it's coming from. Most of the time it does, does actually result in, in some benefit. And on the flip side also, there will be some emissions from the manure that is being applied, some, some methane and nitrogen releases from that, but overall it is largely a benefit. It's just showing the flow both ways. And the next question we have is why the greenhouse gas balance doesn't show any livestock emissions. Yeah, I'll pick that one up. Um, it's purely a simplification at this point in the conversation. So you'll hear um, uh, subsequently in the next section about uh, the fact that we are focused on arable systems, but we do include some livestock integration. And of course, when we do, livestock emissions are included. So it's simply a simplification of that diagram. And the last question we got, um, Okay, does your scheme allow participants, but participants to account for recent changes made prior to joining, which are increasing sequestration? So, yeah, so Tom, I'm going to come on to um, a slide in just a second about um, effectively what happens if you've already adopted good practices. So um, tune in in particular to that slide, I would, I would say. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. So I, I saw your response. Um, great. Let's move on into how it works in practice, because this will um, presumably answer um, and trigger many other questions as well. When we started four years ago on the journey of, of trying to answer this question, how do we unlock carbon payments for farmers, we could see at least four problems that farmers would have to solve in order to do that. The first was, well, how do I calculate my greenhouse gas balance in a way that's robust but also practical you know so i can focus on the business of farming not the business of admin second if i'm going to improve my management practices how do i prove that how do i certify that how do i do that in a way that is credible in the marketplace third how do i access this marketplace this carbon marketplace that people are talking about that's not my usual trade and last but by no means least, if I'm going to be adopting new management practices, how do I make a success of that? How do I manage risk? How do I maintain productivity? And what we've tried to do is bring together um, solutions to each of these four in, in our program, in and through our program. And on the first one, the way we do this is by actually combining uh, a widely um, respected industry model, the Cool Farm tool, which quantifies emissions reductions and soil carbon sequestration. We combine that with soil analysis that you, the farmer, conduct on a five yearly basis. We don't ask you to interact directly with the Cool Farm tool because we know that's cumbersome. And so we've built our own app called My Soil Capital, which gives you a much more seamless map-based interface with all of that calculation methodology on the on the back end. We chose right from the beginning to use an international independent standard to govern everything that we do. We have a rule book that uh, underpins the program and that rule book was assessed by independent auditors against that ISO standard to confirm that we indeed are operating in line with that standard and therefore we generate carbon certificates for you against the improvements to your practices that are made. And so that's a really critical underpinning of how we um, bring credibility to all of this. We are a humble agronomy firm by background, not a carbon markets business. So we partnered with a big carbon markets business called South Pole to gain access to the market on your behalf. And in a variety of ways, we're not just calculating your carbon footprint on an annual basis, but sharing with you knowledge on how to make a success of the practices being implemented. We do that through benchmarking. We do that through uh, knowledge sharing um, resources like podcasts and articles and webinars. We also do field tours. 
And so we actively try to build and share knowledge that can help you make a success of improving farming practices. Equally, we're trying to put that knowledge in the hands, not just of yourselves, but your existing advisory team as well. We're not trying to replace them by any means. Now, every scheme has eligibility rules, and in ours, these are pretty clear. You need to be in the UK, France, or Belgium. So far, so good, I would expect for all of you. Um, it says here you need to be an arable farmer. That is true in the main, although we can accommodate livestock integration up to a certain extent. Um, we've recently expanded that threshold, and if you're in any doubt, simply reach out to us um, for, for confirmation. And it doesn't matter whether you're conventional or organic. There are no other eligibility criteria from our point of view. And I want to emphasize when I'm sort of telling you how this works, that we're not projecting how we hope this will work in the future. We're talking here about, as I said at the very beginning, the longest running certified program in Western Europe. We've got more than 750 farmers signed up across a significant acreage in three countries. And I suppose most importantly on this slide, we've already passed our first payment milestone to the first group of farmers that joined back in 2020. So in June last year, we paid out just under a million euros to the first 100 farmers in France and Belgium that joined. So that's an average of about 10,000 euros at farm level. And that was based on their first year of historical practice improvements, by which I mean, they made the practice improvements in the program. We collected data after that, it was audited, and the payout happened after that. And I'm contrasting that with other approaches that you might see out there in the market where an advance payment is made for some of the expected gains, and then that's adjusted later when real data comes through. We're not into that. We pay based on what has been done in the previous season. It's clean, it's tidy, it's verified and the numbers don't change. And because we focus on carbon insetting, that money in the main came from the sort of supply chain businesses you're seeing on the top right. And increasingly, you may have already heard of us through some of the businesses on the bottom right who are, who are now putting us in front of their clients, their farmers, having looked at the available options in the UK. I've mentioned our rule book and any scheme worth its salt in this market has to convince the markets on at least four major topics. Scientific credibility, additionality, which means convincing the markets that what they're paying for wouldn't have happened otherwise, essentially. Permanence, which means any soil carbon that is being paid for needs to stay there for a reasonable amount of time. It can't simply be released the next year. And verifiability, which is effectively that we're not asking people to trust us, Soil Capital, or you, the farmer. We have a system in place that allows independent auditors to come in and verify for themselves that the numbers that we're basing this all on are fair and accurate. And I was on farm today in Berkshire with our German auditors conducting our second round of audit um, uh, literally uh, as we speak. So this is this is happening. And, you know, I can go into detail on all of these four topics and more about how we do this. But the protocol that we have is the document, as I said earlier, that was verified by that auditor right at the beginning as uh, being compliant with the ISO standard. And it ticks all of these boxes and and, and more. This is a, a simplification of how the process works, therefore. So when you join, the first step is to assess your starting point, otherwise known as a baseline assessment, your year zero. So we will look at your historical management practices over a previous season and calculate your greenhouse gas balance that you're coming into the program with. Then over the following five years, you will go about implementing management practices that achieve emission reductions and or more storage of carbon in the soil. And each year, we will quantify the impact of those management practices compared to your baseline and will generate a volume of carbon certificates against that ISO standard for the difference between the baseline and your annual performance. And each certificate 
is a unit standardized of one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. So it also accommodates the other greenhouse gases. These certificates are what those companies, in our case, in the supply chain, are buying. And that's what's generating the revenue incentive we flow back to you. And I'll come on to the specifics of that revenue incentive uh, on a subsequent slide. But in a nutshell, this is how it works. Now, Tom, you asked earlier about um, sort of early adopter practices, and I'm going to answer that question right now. I'll frame it in the way that it's written here. If I already am storing carbon, am I at a disadvantage, in particular from this additionality rule that I have to convince the markets that what they're paying for wouldn't have happened otherwise? In many schemes, you are actually disadvantaged if you're an early adopter. Uh, and that's a perverse consequence of how the carbon markets work. But I'm pleased to say that's not the case in our scheme. And this is, this is how. We actually run two different methodologies for generating carbon certificates for you, depending on your starting point, your baseline. So what you're seeing here on the left is a schematic of a farm's greenhouse gas balance through time. And the yellow bar is the baseline. And it's a positive number above zero, which shows that it is a net emitting baseline. Here it's net emitting around about 1.5 tonnes of CO2 per hectare. Now, in this case, it is very simple and very consistent with how other programmes in the market work. We fix your baseline at that yellow level for five years, and you need to improve against your own personal historical performance to generate a carbon revenue. And that applies while you're still net emitting, the red bar here, and as you travel through net zero and beyond. So it's the white arrow here, which is indicating on a per hectare basis, your carbon certificate generation rate per year. So this is how it works if you're net emitting when you start. And this is the situation that would create a perverse incentive if you were an early adopter, because you would say, well, I've got less room to improve against my own personal baseline. And therefore actually I've got the the perverse incentive to artificially, if you like, make my baseline worse by getting the plow back out of the hedge or whatever. And we don't want that. It's, it's crazy on multiple levels. This is how we deal with that. If you join the program and at your baseline assessment, you are better than net zero. You are already net storing carbon. And through the following five years, you continue in our modeling to show that you're adding carbon to the soil. That's crucial. We don't use your own historical emissions as your baseline. We use a regional baseline. So effectively, we analyze what is common farming practice in your region. There are about seven or eight regions in England to give you a sense of scale. And it is that which is fixed for five years and is that which you're compared against. And so even if you just maintain those practices, if those are still adding carbon to the soil each year, you are additional from a climate point of view and you're additional from a societal point of view compared to other farmers. Therefore, we're using that regional baseline to generate certificates for you. Of course, you can also further improve and that will increase the height of the white arrows here. So Tom, I hope that's addressed your question in, in some way. Now, a question I got last night at a farmer group was, was exactly this. You know, this sounds um, like it could evolve into a lot of admin. Um, well, we've worked extremely hard um, with technology software developers in-house, sitting alongside those who really understand the farmer's reality to build the MISOL Capital software that you interact with. It's map-based, as you can see here, and that's how you're encoding your operational data each year. And what we're finding is that, you know, especially once that initial setup year is done, this is taking farmers on average no more than three hours per year to update their data. So I think that that addresses the admin point. It's a, it's a manageable commitment um, in terms of conveying your data into the system. Um, and on top of that, I suppose I'll say at this point that we're not prescribing how you farm. We're not telling you you must do certain things and we're not telling you you mustn't do certain things. We give you information and of course the financial incentive to, to improve the greenhouse gas balance of your system. 
you are in control for how you do that. The other common question we get is, you know, am I going to be tied in here, especially to meet that market expectation on permanence? And the answer with Soar Capital is no. We give you full flexibility. You can leave the program whenever you like. There is no exit fee. And there is no clawback. You will find a clawback with other schemes available in the UK, which means basically if you leave, you may have to pay back some of the money you've already received. That's not the case with Soar Capital. And this is how we deliver that flexibility while respecting that permanence principle. This is a schematic for the entire duration of the program from your point of view. You join in year zero, as I've described, you go through that first five year period where you're generating certificates each year. Each year, we're selling those certificates and you're being paid annually. But the detail there is that we're actually holding back 20% of the certificates that you generate each year and placing them into a sort of insurance mechanism, which is called a buffer. And when they go into that insurance mechanism, they need to stay there for a total of 10 years. During that period, we monitor the farm using satellite imagery, because what we're particularly looking for is um, an increase in the intensity of cultivations, of tillage, because that's the main mechanism by which you lose carbon from the soil. If there's no risk of loss detected, the certificates can be released after 10 years and sold as normal, and the proceeds flow back to you. And that aligns a positive financial incentive for you with the market's expectation on permanence. So if you want to maximize your financial gain, you stick with the program for 15 years. But to repeat, you can leave at any point. And what you by now may be spotting is that the only consequence of leaving is that you sacrifice what you've contributed to the buffer. Nobody else benefits. We certainly don't. They're not sold. Those certificates are then destroyed. They're, they're ripped up because we're no longer monitoring your farm. We have to assume a release of carbon from the soil. And that's how we deliver you the flexibility that I talked about. So that gives you really the ultimate answer to any of your what if questions. What if the government does this? What if the supply chain does that? Um, you know, we'll have some thoughts on some of those scenarios that you might have in your minds, but ultimately we're not crystal ball gazers. We, we can't predict exactly what the government will do in five years. I wish we could. Um, this approach gives you the ultimate flexibility to leave the program if it turns out that it's not the right thing for you to be doing. And it's our job to make sure that the program is the right thing for you to be doing. Right, we're gonna to start to, to finish up the presentation by talking about money. Um, we have two pricing plans. One's called a standard plan, and one, one is called a basic plan. On the standard plan, the key difference is that you pay upfront for each carbon assessment of your farm. So to be clear, once for the baseline, and then a following five times for each annual assessment during that five year period of generating carbon certificates. And you get paid after year one. So that's the standard plan. On the basic plan, we waive that upfront cost. It's zero. But obviously we then take the risk that you're going to generate carbon improvements, generate carbon certificates, and generate revenue through that. And we compensate for that by taking a greater commission on the certificate sales. So with the standard plan, we make a very straightforward commitment. And I'm going to use slightly different numbers to what's on the screen because it makes it even clearer for you. So each year we're selling the carbon certificates in the market, different buyers, different prices. We average those out each year to have an average final sales price. You, the farmer on the standard plan, will always get the same fixed percentage of that final sales price. And that fixed percentage is 70, 70 of that final sales price. So however high the price goes each year, which is a common expectation that it will rise, you're positioned to benefit each year. The 30% that is retained is not just a commission to sell capital, that also covers the costs of our sales partner, South Pole, as well as this annual audit. 
on the basic plan, that number is 50% of the final sales price. So clearly less reward on the basic plan, but also lower risk. And it appeals to perhaps smaller farms. Uh, it also appeals to those who maybe need a bit more time to get comfortable with a scheme like this. Now, ultimately, um, many of your questions may be about what does this mean for me financially? We're going to present in the final section from Lyndon some typical numbers, some illustrative numbers, but there is no better way to answer the question than to simulate it for real for your farm, your rotation, your soil type, your management practices. And to do that, we've built a simulator. Um, many of you may have already used it actually on this call. It takes you know just a few minutes to plug in some, some simple details. And that will allow you to understand are you net emitting or net storing carbon? And with the sorts of management practice changes or management practices you're thinking about, what could that mean in terms of um, your earnings using our minimum pricing? I actually forgot to mention our minimum pricing on the previous slide. So as well, in, as, well as fixing your, your proportion of that final sales price, we also impose on ourselves as a, as a scheme, a minimum price, a floor price. And that sits at the moment at £23 per, per certificate, per tonne. Um, uh, and that really just ensures that we don't waste your time in going through all of this effort and then returning to you a, a sum that is so paltry it makes, makes you laugh. For context, as you'll see in a little moment, when we paid out in June, we actually paid out closer to £27 per certificate because the market was, was healthier than, than this £23 minimum pound level. But this simulator, if you haven't already used it, is your gateway to understanding really what could this mean for, for you on your system. Lyndon, I can see some questions building up, so let's try and tackle those on the practicalities before leaving time to look at the case studies before the top of the hour. Sure. Uh, first one is how we determine who buys the carbon within an in-setting uh, model. Uh, yeah, is there any more detail on the question? Is it sort of around the definition of supply chains or something like that? So, uh, I mean, it, we produce sugar beet as well as wheat and um, malting barley. Yep. How do, how do you determine which of those, uh, you know, which of those supply chains is going to be the one that uh, benefits from our insetting? Yeah, so it is done on a crop by crop basis, James. You know, we're we're looking for supply chain partners in you know sugar beet, in wheat, in barley, etc. Um, I will add that you know that doesn't mean that we can always cover the entire rotation cleanly and easily. For the remainder, we're still not engaging in offsetting. We engage in um, trades with companies that want to support farmers to adopt these beneficial management practices and are happy not to claim any offsetting, but instead just with a claim to talk publicly about the results that they've um, supported. So the answer to your question is crop by crop, and then you know bits that are left over perhaps can be dealt with with um, that results-based claim. And, and can you then be sure that everybody that we would be supplying is, is engaged in this type of programme? Well, of course, the reality of commodity supply chains is that in many cases, growers won't know where their crop, where their produce ends up. That, that, that's the blunt reality of a supply chain in a commodity context, right? Um, and the scope, the, 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 the carbon accounting community are well aware of this. And so they've set out um, a methodology um, which is often described using the phrase supply shed. It basically allows you to connect buyers of crops with producers in commodity contexts where you can't be sure if that ton of wheat is actually being consumed by that grain trader. It's effectively using other ways to identify the overlap, like are they sourcing from the region in which the farmer is growing or are there overlaps in intermediaries and so actually we're not required to get to the level of of your question of being absolutely sure that the end user of the wheat is the buyer because that's simply not feasible or realistic in a, in a commodity context. Lyndon what's next? 
<laughs> next couple of questions i will answer those anyway um one question on if i carry out a carbon audit with an external uh, person for example the coal farm tool can we use that the answer is no it's not just us being awkward there's a long list of reasons why we, we can't um, take that into account everything must go through the soil capital platform and um, the next question was if i go backwards uh, against the baseline do i have to buy certificates in the marketplace to, to bring myself back up i've answered it in chat but just to stress that no you, you absolutely won't if you're a net emitter and you go backwards to emit even more you just won't generate any carbon certificates therefore no carbon payment if you go backwards as a net sequesterer and you're still above the regional baseline, you will still generate carbon certificates just less so than your baseline year. The next question, Andrew, uh, someone wants to know if they can put everything down to a grass and clover mix and go on holiday for five years. And cash in. <laughs> go on holiday for five years and cash in. I think, look, the, uh, the way I'll answer the cheeky question is to define the difference between a temporary lay and a permanent pasture, which is indeed the five year cutoff um, that we're familiar with from DEFRA. So if you've got a two, three year herbal lay as part of the rotation, that counts as part of the arable rotation. Um, putting the whole place down, I mean, we, um, uh, we don't see that commonly. I understand the premise of the question. We are focused as well on keeping arable systems in arable production. So I think um, there is a challenge if there is not any harvested crop coming off the rotation. Um, but I'm, I'm going to choose to interpret the question primarily as how do we define the difference between the temporary and the permanent um, pasture, which, I, which I've given. So we do have some organic farmers that will have, for example, a five year rotation and they will have two years of grass or three years of grass and that. So no, uh, no need to um, completely discount. Grass. Um, next question was on countryside stewardship. Um, I guess it's a good opportunity to cover SFI as well, Andrew. Yeah, we are compatible with SFI, so you can be in both at the same time. Countryside stewardship, similarly, we can accommodate. Um, there's a bit of nuance here, so I won't go into all of the details, but effectively, if you're already in a stewardship scheme, virtually all scenarios, you can move seamlessly into soil capital carbon as well but talk to us about um, some of the nuance. Um, so no real blockers there. And the last question, or no, sorry, the last two questions now, the 980 pound charge, same for any farm size, uh, answer it in chat, but yes, for this season, uh, yes, 980 pounds, the same for all farms, which often makes the basic plan more sensible for the smaller farm or for someone that's sequestering less. And last question, just on your, um, sales of, of carbon certificates what if grain is going to a local farmers for feed so not anybody buying it actually in the larger supply chain buyers yeah i sort of hinted at the answer to that earlier on to james's question with this definition of supply sheds you know in the context of commodity markets at the moment the carbon accounting um, world isn't looking for that precise chain of traceability so um, that that shouldn't be a blocker today Lyndon, I'm conscious of time that people may be booked to head off at six. Let's quickly cover um, the scenarios here, the case studies, and then give people clarity on next steps before the end of February, before we sure. close. I'll keep it, keep it short and snappy. Um, okay, so what did farmers earn from our one million pounds or nearly one million pounds of payments last year, June 2022? Um, so it was an average of 9,000 per, per farm, but a medium of around 4,000 pounds. Now, what this, what I'm going to concentrate here is the graph on the right. Um, each individual vertical line is an individual farm. So that's an individual payment. You will see that the top 10% top of farms, so roughly the 10 lines on the right, will range from about 25,000 up to 85,000 there or thereabouts. So these are the high sequesters, the large farms, the, the ones that are getting lots of organic manures, perhaps direct drilling, cover cropping, and so on. So... A slight outlier and that they are the top 10%. Then we're into a slightly different band of, of um, payments from around 10,000 to 18, 19,000, 10,000 to 20,000. We've got around 15, 20 farms. So another 20% um, who are earning in that band. So that's 30% that is earning above 10,000 up to a maximum of 85. 
And then we get to the vast majority, where the vast majority will fall into, um, which is this band in the middle, where people are earning from around 1,000 up to the 10,000 mark. And that's generally what we will see um, for that farm size of the first cohort of farmers. Uh, the We do also have demonstrated in this graph that some farmers did not earn anything. We try to avoid that scenario because it does it is a slight waste of time for the farmer if they don't earn anything at the end of it. So we'd be really, really realistic when we have these conversations if it is going to be worth it for the farmer or not. And now just to cover some examples, some uh, case studies of actual farmers in the programme. So we've got a 325 hectare arable farm in East Anglia. They're on a six year rotation rotationally plowing across the across the rotation. They do have sugar beet and potatoes in the rotation. They're, they're doing minimal cover cropping, but moving to 30% cover cropping across the rotation. So my reason for including this was to have a root cropping farmer and net emitting overall and a root cropping conventional farmer typically hitting milling wheat standards uh, across, um, across his rotation. So his plan was to, on his lighter land, introduce some min-till techniques where he can get away with having to use a de-stoner for, for the potatoes. Um, so around a third of his farm and introduce some cover cropping before it. Now, these were practices that he was already interested in doing. He was already thinking about doing it. And the carbon payment was going to be the cherry on top of that. So by doing those practices, reducing his emissions, so he will still probably be a net emitter, but he will be less of an emitter, and he will earn at least forty pounds per hectare in carbon payments in his first year. Um, but yeah, that's just one example, uh, and another another example to reinforce that we don't ban ploughing uh, in this program. And then on the flip side, we do have a net sequestering farmer. Um, so this farmer has 240 hectares uh, in Berkshire, medium, medium clay, and some loamy land as well. A six-year rotation. He's transitioned to direct drilling a few years ago, I think around six years ago now. Um, so quite on the way of being the, the so-called regenerative, regenerative farmer. Um, growing multi-species cover crops ahead of whatever spring crops he has. So ahead of spring oats and beans where possible. Uh, which are grazed by, by a neighbor's sheep also, chops a straw and gets some biosolids and is, has always been working on nitrogen use reduction and more efficiency from that. So this farmer has already been doing this for a number, number of years and he's benefiting from our regional baseline, our net sequestering farmer uh, benefit rather than having to improve on what he's already doing. And he'll expect at least 50 pounds per hectare uh, in carbon payments off of the first year. And I just want to reinforce this as well, that he isn't uh, applying lots of manures or and he's, his spring crops are in the minority of his cropping rotation. So it's not like he has a huge amount of cover crops uh, in that either. And then just to, to close off a bit of a recap about the opportunities for farmers. Um, so Andrew will have said a few of these, but Annual carbon payments, so you will be driving, you'll be riding the market with a market-driven price. So last year we we implemented a base price of twenty three pounds, and we were able to beat that, um, which brought it closer to twenty seven pounds. Actually, paid out the farmers, or I think it actually might be slightly more than that. Um, we have no binding commitment and no prescribed practices. So as again, we don't ban plowing. We don't prescribe that, that you have to do something in particular. You farm how you want to farm. And if it's worth it on a carbon perspective, fantastic. Our certification is recognized in international markets focused on insetting, so not in the offsetting market. And we are independently audited to, to get that certification. We are a program that rewards emitting and sequestering farms to reinforce that. And one we didn't really speak about is that we position ourselves or position yourself, uh, the farmer, for the low carbon crops of tomorrow. So we are often getting people in the supply chain, companies in the supply chain, looking for a low carbon crop, for a net zero crop. And if you if you certify yourself in a program such as this, you can you can go to market with that net zero crop. 
Thanks, Lyndon. So I'm conscious of time um, and I'll just finish up on this slide. Um, and for those of you that can stay, we'll, we'll answer any final questions that are still with you. Now, as I said right at the beginning, we have this annual sign up deadline of the end of February. So uh, time is clearly short this year. Now, for some of you, this will have just been a general interest webinar, and, and this gives you more information to think about for next year. But to be clear, if you miss that deadline in the next week, it would push back your opportunity to generate carbon revenue by a year. So um, if this has helped to clarify issues and to motivate you, you've basically got two ways to take that next step before the end of February. One is the self-serve, you know, run a simulation on our simulator, it's on our website, and sign up um, today on either the basic plan or the standard plan. And the other option is um, assisted serve. I don't really know what the right phrase would be, but um, you will get an email shortly after this webinar with a recording of the session, um, and it will have two um, buttons. One is inviting you to, to sign up on your own, but another would be to book a meeting with uh, Lyndon or one of the rest of the team to talk about your situation, questions that are on your mind. Um, and we will be looking out for your interest um, to address your um, to address your questions um, urgently in the coming days before before the end of the month, if that's the case. So please look out for that email in the, the next few hours. Um, and we will include uh, a copy of the slides in the email as well, James. I've just seen that um, seen that question. So thank you very much for all of you who've uh, attended. Um, let me just have a quick look back through the questions now to see if we've missed um, any questions. Um, James, I see your comment that you say it seems a bit odd that the net sequestering farmer is only earning £10 per hectare more. Don't be too um, fixated on the numbers we've used there. These are illustrative from just two farmers. Um, uh, and on the net emitter side, we were talking about um, the possibilities for his practice change rather than what he actually has gone on to do. So uh, take those with a bit of pinch of salt. Um, from Ben, I see a question. Once the first five years is complete and I'm in the retention period, can I restart the crediting period on this on at this on the same time on the same land, or is this double funding? Yes. So in our terms and conditions, you do have the opportunity at the end of year five to start another five-year period. Now, your baseline would be reset at that point, reevaluated. Um, but otherwise, everything else currently would stay the same. And Douglas has asked a very brief question, just saying cattle, question mark. Um, Douglas, are you on the line? Do you want to add a few more words to your question? Maybe muted and now trying to type quickly. I can see something coming through. I'll maybe just add some context that, uh, as I said earlier, yes, we can accommodate some livestock integration, cattle, sheep, etc. Um, we have a limit before we effectively become classed as a program for livestock. Um, and so uh, if you were to go into our simulator and, and to, to um, uh, sign up for the program, you would quickly be asked for details about livestock heads to assess your, your eligibility. We can also assess that for you very quickly and easily if you want to book a meeting. So Douglas, uh, yes, are there procedures that can help sequester carbon on livestock farms, for example, mob grazing? Great question, Douglas. Um, today, no. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, we position our program as a program today that's for arable farms. We want to be able to quantify the benefits of mob grazing on increasing carbon stored in grasslands. Um, and to date, the available options for quantifying that in a, in a scalable way um, haven't been there. So um, that is something that we're actively working on behind the scenes so that we can um, say yes to exactly your question. Can we opt in on a part holding basis or is this done on holding numbers from James? 
Um, so you do need to enroll your entire arable system, um, as in we're not allowed to have cherry picking of individual blocks of land or fields. However, what of course happens in reality is that farmers will be working across some uh, you know, the home farm that's owned together with um, some rented land or contract farming somewhere else. And yes, we can we can accept um, the owned land, the home farm as an entry um, if it is more logistically uh, challenging to bring in rented land or contract farmland, which would need the um, the approval of the land owner in the, in the context of the contract farming business. Can you do it in reverse? Say again, James. Can you do it in reverse? Because in our particular instance, obviously we've got the livestock operation, which is part of the the home farm arrangement, but we've got uh, client farms who are not involved in livestock farming, who I think possibly would be able to tick a box with this more easily than I can do with the livestock. So you're when you say do it in reverse, you're talking about the client farms being being able to sign up without you know with, with without us signing up so if i if i can persuade my client farms to uh, to to join in this scheme can yeah. they come in on the basis that we're doing their farming for them yes yes um we have plenty of examples of contract farmers um approaching their landowners and in the end it's the landowner that comes in but the contract farmer who executes the management practices and they agree between themselves an appropriate sp split of the costs and the benefits. Okay. I need to speak to a few people. <laughs> um, Guy, there seems to be no accounting for field hedges. You're right. We're going stubble to stubble with the boundary being the field edge. Why? Because by background, we're an agronomy firm. We know about the business of farming not so much hedge management, but equally, um, there are plenty of um, subsidy schemes in place for hedge management, which has created problems for us around that additionality topic, double funding, um, which is why we, we draw the line there. I know it's frustrating to sort of carve up um, a real entity, you know, arable land, grassland, woodland, hedges, etc and say, well, Soil Capital is only looking at the arable portion, um, but that is why. All right, I think we've probably uh, answered the questions in the chat. Of course, we're available for any further questions that anyone may have afterwards. Um, you will get an email shortly with um, the promised materials and follow-up steps. Um, so contact us through that um, email. And uh, if we can help, many of you come on board before the end of February, we'd be delighted to work with you. So thank you again for your time this evening. And we hope that has been helpful. We've got just one more, um, uh, Anthony, sorry, just one from Simon of any implications on entering into an HLS, a stewardship scheme this year, um, which I think can be answered that it, it depends is the, is the short answer. Um, it's probably worth a chat with one of us, but fairly simply, um, if it's a small amount of the farm, big chance that it's no issue if you're entering half the farm there's there's more likely that's going to be an issue but have a chat with one of us and we can very quickly establish if that's it's eligible or not terrific thank you everyone thank you for the thanks and uh we will leave you to the rest of your evening have a good one bye for now cheers everyone <laughs>